Welcome to the Berkeley Historical Society's series, Coming to the Bay. Today, we are very pleased to have with us Min Le, who came to the Bay in 1975 from Vietnam. Min was born in 1937 in what was then French Indochine and endured the privation and violence of World War II under Japanese occupation. He spent his school years under French occupation and the French Indochine War. Eventually joining the Foreign Service, Min did two tours in America during the tumultuous 1960s and 70s. Please welcome Min Le. Welcome, Min Le. Let's begin with your family's history. So your family has a history of government service. Your paternal grandfather and your father both served in the government. Um, I believe your paternal grandfather was an elected official. You want to tell us about yeah. your, your grandfather? Well, now, uh, both grandfathers. First, my paternal grandfather was a chief of a village in the Mekong Delta of South Vietnam. Uh, he was an elected low-level official and he was a small landowner and he gave some education to his nine children. Um, unlike my maternal grandfather, he was so rich, so wealthy that uh, he and his uh, children, nine of them too, thought that they didn't need an education in order to be successful in life. They had so much money. So that was the big difference between the two families. And fortunately, I inherited the, uh, uh, the, uh, the way my grandparents educated my Aunts, my uncles and my aunties, I had some education. I think that's a, a modest understatement. You had a lot of education, mm -hmm. yes. So your father was the youngest of the nine children? Yes, he was uh, number nine son. Yes. And uh, at a, quite a young age, at 14, he left Vietnam to study at Lycée, at what we would call high school, mm -hmm. in, in Bordeaux. And that, um, what, why did he take that step? Yeah, when my father was 14 years old, he suddenly wanted to go to France. Maybe because, I don't know for sure, but maybe because he felt that his village was so small that uh, his village was a confined, restricted world. So he wanted to escape. Like me, I wanted to escape later. Uh, so he, he insisted that my grandfather send him to France. My father's insistence, my grandfather put him on a boat, a passenger cargo French boat by the name Cambodia. It was in French, Cambodge. I will take that same boat later from the Philippines to Vietnam. Uh, since he was a minor, my father was 
in the company of a Vietnamese Mandarin on his way to France. Uh, uh, but it, right after his arrival in Bordeaux, France, my grandparents died and my father was over himself in France at that young age and, and his siblings, my uncles and my aunties simply abandoned him in France. Nobody sent him any money and I am in a blur. I don't know how he survived by himself in France but later on a French family took him in and he went through the lycée and also he I know that he took odd jobs he worked as a night monitor in a boarding school uh, and then when he grew older he worked as a cheminot that's a railway worker in the midi of France this in southern France that was his last job before he returned to French in China. And he returned only when he had graduated from high school and got uh, his baccalaureate. After, yes, after he received his baccalaureate, he uh, returned to Indochina. And because he was very angry with his sibling for abandoning him in France, he went straight to Phnom Penh, Cambodia and uh, worked in the French customs in Cambodia. Quite a story and I'm wondering why your father didn't return to Vietnam when he was left abandoned and penniless in France. I think he was angry with his family and maybe with Vietnam too. So he just abandoned family and country. Um, that was why my birth certificate showed that because of my ethnicity through my father, I was born a French subject and the birth certificate specified that I uh, was an ethnic Vietnamese. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your father's time all alone in, in France because that sounds like quite a story. I don't know much about uh, his uh, life and how he survived all alone by, uh, by himself in France. But I know that even in Vietnam, when I was a, a still a little boy, I remember he kept complaining about uh, his hunger and the cold in France. And he, he, because of that, he would let uh, his children go overseas, but everybody wanted to go overseas. I mean, I mean, my siblings and, and myself. Yes. So y your father, I believe, was born in 1910. And I'm just wondering, was he educated in French? Yes, totally in French. Okay, so even in a village in the Mekong Delta, the schools were conducted in French? The uh, education on the elementary level was bilingual. Uh, my education also started bilingually. Uh, both French and Vietnamese were taught in school. Well, so let's rejoin your father in, in Phnom Penh. So I believe he got married shortly after he 
came back and it was an arranged marriage. The cousin made the arrangement so that my father could return from Phnom Penh to the Mekong Delta. Uh, he met uh, my mother, married my mother and brought her back to Phnom Penh where I was born in July 11, 1937. So after only three years, though, your, your family moved to Saigon. Was that because of your father's work? Yes, my father was assigned to Saigon uh, as a member of the French colonial administration. He could be assigned anywhere in French Indochina. Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia. So he ended up in Saigon, Vietnam, where more of my siblings will be born. Uh, my next younger brother was born in Phnom Penh too. So two of us were Cambodians and six of us were Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. So not long after moving back to Saigon, World War II started, or it had already started actually elsewhere, but mm -hmm. um, the Japanese arrived when you were a small child. Can you tell us a little bit about the occupation by the Japanese? Yes, I don't remember anything about the Japanese occupation. I don't remember ever having met a Japanese soldier, but I learned about the occupation from my mother, not from my father. My father was not talkative, mm -hmm. but my mother taught me a lot about the Japanese occupation. And she said that the Japanese soldiers were the most brutal foreign soldiers in Vietnam. That's what I know. I have no proof, I have no memory. Yes. Um, so there was a lot of suffering. You mentioned that you were poor yeah. and hungry. Yes, uh, when toward the end of World War II, the Americans started started bombing Saigon. They bombed the Japanese, but I don't think any Japanese soldier got hurt, but the Vietnamese were, got killed. And one of my uncle died in the bombing. Uh, he, his body was never recovered. He was working in a an office building across the street from the Japanese garrison. The Japanese garrison, that I remember, was not hit at all by American bombs, but the area around the Japanese were destroyed. And the streets, when I grew up, the streets were still pucked. Uh, uh, there were still bomb craters in the street that I remember. And you and your family took shelter from the bombs? Yes, I was at the receiving end of the bombing and it was terrible. Uh, that was too much for a, a, a young boy to know what war was. And from home, I ran to a, a, cor a corner in the neighborhood where there were trenches all dug up in advance in anticipation of the American bombing. So 
So I was there in the trenches, a dirty trench, wet trench, because it was raining all the time in Vietnam. And who was with you in the trench? My mother. My father was at work. So when the American bombed Saigon, my father was always at work. So my mother was with us. Mm -hmm. And your your younger siblings as yes, well. Yes. Yeah. Incredible. So eventually, you fled with your mother to the Mekong Delta. Yes, my father decided to stay behind to continue to work in Saigon and he hired a sampan and he uh, hired two men to row the sampan transporting my mother and me and four of my siblings who were by then five uh, to the Mekong Delta First, we stayed in the uh, house of my maternal grandparents, but it was too dangerous, and the house was hit three times by bandits. Mm. So my mother was so afraid, she took us all to my, grand my paternal grandparents, also in the Mekong Delta, but it was safer there, mm -hmm. uh, where I was put up in one of my uncle's house, while my mother stayed behind in my grandparents' house. Mm -hmm. So I went to first grade there in Gantho, C-A-N-T-H-O, in the Mekong Delta. That was the first time I went to school. I think I was five. Yeah. I see. Five or six. Mm -hmm. were, the, were the teachers Vietnamese? The teachers were Vietnamese, all Vietnamese. And you mentioned before that you were very poor, and was that because you weren't getting any money from your father? Yes. Uh, lack of communication, lack of uh, transportation. Uh, my mother was uh, alone um, raising us and we were all small kids. So my mother had to sell uh, cigarettes around the corner and we were always hungry growing up. We had to eat cricket, uh, what they call coconut worm, uh, even rat. I would eat anything that grow. And, uh, and we lived in a storage shed uh, next to my grandparents' house. And in the shed, we have to live with snake, uh, barn owl, scorpion, rats. Well, that was the countryside. We had mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And then we got sick. I had everything cholera, diarrhea, dysentery, uh, uh, malaria. That's why I now I am. I think immunized to most tropical diseases. Yes. yes. And, and meanwhile, the um, the city was occupied. Saigon was occupied by the Japanese. Yes. But, and and how was the government, the colonial government, functioning? Uh, when the Japanese marched into Indochina, the French did not resist. They just 
give you know, China away to the Japanese and dutifully reported to concentration camp. But the Japanese let a skeleton uh, French colonial administration run French Indochina. The Japanese did the fighting, the French run the country. Mm -hmm. and, and your father was, he continued? Still with the French colonial administration. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Office of Rice Production? Yes. Well, so you must have been very, very glad when the war ended. Uh, I couldn't tell where the war ended because the successive wars were all in a series of events. I hardly could tell the French Indochina War from the American War because there were always foreign troops in Vietnam. And I was in uniform myself. I was French or Vietnamese or American. We were almost the same uniform mm -hmm. on the same side. Mm -hmm. were, were you wearing a uniform when you were at school? Yes, uh, I was in uh, Preparation Militaire. That was military preparation or a kind of American ROTC, but the money came from the United States. Mm -hmm. The instructors were French military. I see. At, at what age did you join? The I was a teenager, 16 or 17. I was already in uniform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so when you came back to Saigon and the, the Japanese were gone, did you experience the return of the French, more French coming back? It was quite peaceful, uh, unlike in North Vietnam, the French uh, marched back to South Vietnam and if uh, French uh, administration continued on, um, education was back to French. Even under the Japanese, education was in French. The Japanese didn't interfere much in, uh, in civilian life. That's why I, I don't have any memory about the Japanese. And it was quite a peaceful transition back to French uh, government in South Vietnam. North Vietnam was a big, big battle between the French and the Communists. Uh, after the Japanese defeat, the Ho Chi Minh declared independence from France for North Vietnam. South Vietnam was a French colony separated from North Vietnam. Um, as we know, Ho Chi Minh was an agent of international communism. He was a Frenchman in France, along with another Frenchman. He founded the French Communist Party. So he was really a, an, a, an agent of international communism. And then from there, he went to Moscow and again participated in the foundation of the Soviet Union as an international communist. And then from Moscow, he went to China and along with Mao Zedong, he fought Chiang Kai-shek 
to set up communist China. From there, he went to Vietnam to found the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. He was never fighting for Vietnam, but his propaganda said that he was fighting as a nationalist Vietnamese against the French. And the people believed him, especially the, the peasants, the villagers, the rural population. They were captive of communism. They believed everything. Only about 10% of Vietnamese like me did not believe in communism. Uh, 90% of the Vietnamese were communist captives. So how could we fight them? We could think for ourselves, but the villagers couldn't think for themselves. They were uneducated. I was educated. And as I learned from the French, French philosopher Pascal said, Je pense donc je suis. I think, therefore, I am. That means I am myself. I can think for myself. Mm. I was anti-communist very early in my life because I could think, and I learned it from the French. Mm. So I'm, I'm wondering how your father felt about the French administration in this period. Uh, it, it was quite a vote. I'm sorry, I was speaking French. <laughs> and about face? About face, about face. Uh, it was all French until somehow he turned anti-French. I don't know where and when it happened, but suddenly he was in the deep in the anti-French underground. And although he was a, a Frenchman in the French colonial administration, he was arrested by the French three times. I did not witness the first two times when he was arrested, but I witnessed the third time when he was arrested in the middle of the night. French soldiers came to our house and arrested my father, my mother, and my mother had to bring the last brother of mine, the first, a, a, new, a newly born brother of mine, along with her to prison with her. Uh, the French, a French soldier started beating my friend, my father. My father fell under the military truck and before that I took it for granted that the the French were just one of us in Vietnam. I started to hate the French that early in my teens. And uh, that youngest brother of mine who went to prison with my mother, he was my first investment in America as a, a diplomat in Washington, I took him from South Vietnam to America and sent him to the University of Maryland. And he is now my best investment in America and the most successful among the brothers here because he, live, he lives in a gated community on top of a hill overlooking Los Angeles. Mm. And I'm proud of the, the fact that I rescued him from Vietnam. Yes. 
maybe we should go back a little bit to your schooling and what was going on with you. So you started second grade and when you returned to Saigon? I started, I, I think I repeated the first grade. My first grade in the Mekong downtown didn't work. So I had to go to the first grade again. And I remember my, yes, my first grade, a uh, beautiful teacher. She was married to a Frenchman. I, I have a fond memory of her, but my second grade teacher was a nightmare because of my Cambodian birth. Although I didn't care whether I was Vietnamese or Cambodian, I didn't know about my birth at all. But uh, since my name was Min, and the Vietnamese looked down on the Cambodians and called the Cambodian men, and men means barbarian. So my second grade teacher uh, intentionally mispronounced my name and called me men. Whenever he called men, the whole class laughed and he really persecuted me throughout the year. He beat me in the behind with a bamboo rod called for punishment. It was still acceptable in Vietnam and in France. And he made, he, re, he made me repeat the second grade too. I was just a village boy. From then on, I made two resolutions. I was, since I was made aware that I was an underdog, in order to beat the Vietnamese, I must be a better student. And I became the first in my class ever since to beat the Vietnamese. And then when I learned that I was a second class secret citizen, French citizen, I was an underdog, I must beat the French by speaking and writing better French. And I am glad I made those two resolutions that I kept. So, as hopefully you you got better teachers. You had some some good teachers as you went uh, on. Yes, I remember I had very good Vietnamese teachers. Uh, the best Vietnamese teacher taught me French. His French was excellent, and I learned French from him from a Vietnamese, not from a French teacher. Your curriculum, were you studying mostly French and European history and French literature and thought? Yes, yeah. I was uh, a student of uh, a Tory 100% French curriculum, mm -hmm. but uh, I was taught Vietnamese as they call it a national language. Mm -hmm. And in examination, Vietnamese became my first foreign language. Excellent. French was the official language. Excellent. And Excellent. even my diploma came from the University of Paris. So I, since you studied French for a long time, I'm imagining that there were writers or philosophers that whom you really liked. I like all of them. They are so good. And since my thinking was in French, I was more fluent in French than in Vietnamese. And I, I like Victor Hugo, Racine, Molière, Guy de Maupassant. I can 
there is a long series of French authors and philosophers and historians that uh, I like. But at the same time, the French colonialists around you were being quite cruel often. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, I remember one incident. Uh, I was a teenager. I was talking with uh, my French next, next door neighbor, Monsieur Marcel Trigaro. Uh, suddenly, a Vietnamese old man came to the door and begged for money and food. And my neighbor shouted, What down? go away and I started hating him so much. First I liked him, he was a good neighbor, uh, but that, that was no way to treat a beggar, a French beggar, a Vietnamese beggar, a Cambodian beggar, it's a beggar, treat him well. And so I hated the French so much. And I still go to, went to school and learned about the French authors. And so it was a contradiction, but uh, that was life in a colony. Mm -hmm. You mentioned also that the, the French army took rather violent reprisals against the, the, the anti-French Yes, uh, uh, that was when I was in uh, elementary school. One morning I was out the door going to school when boom! A, pro-French Vietnamese journalist went to the garage in the back, in his backyard to start his car to go to work. A communist, I would say a communist, not a Viet Minh or a Vietnamese nationalist, a communist, threw a grenade. The grenade exploded and killed him. And, and I learned later, much later, but the following day the French retaliated. They displayed two dead bodies, two dead Vietnamese in prison uniform, in prison garb. And one more body around another corner in the neighborhood. And I learned later when I read French history textbook how the Nazi Germans treated the French. If you kill one of us, we'll kill three of you. The French did exactly the same thing to the Vietnamese. So again, I love uh, French culture, French language, but I hate, I hate, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, understandable. It sounded very, very cruel. Cool. Well, finally, in 1954, the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu, and the, the French signed the Geneva Agreement dividing Vietnam between the North and the South. And the French withdrew, and that offered more room for advancement for more educated Vietnamese. Yes, uh, <coughs> when the French left, lock, stock, and barrel, the uh, Vietnamese elite took over. So that included my father. 
the took over from his French boss. He became director of the office of rice production. He bought his uh, boss's house. It was a decent, uh, good house, colonial house. And he bought his French boss's uh, car, you know, the classic black seat away. So suddenly he became, well, the elite, but indigenous elite, because there were two elites in Indochina. The European elite, they, they were paid much better than the, the, uh, the native elite. So my father was promoted upstairs. Did that change your life also? Oh yes, a lot. But we we ate better. We were better dressed. We had uh, a better uh, station in uh, life on a higher level or a higher uh, rank of the social ladder and prestige. Mm -hmm.